On this episode of History Hunters, Jeff and Sarah hike the historic Mist Trail in Yosemite National Park and revisit the long forgotten historical aspects of the trail to Half Dome. How do you feel about hiking Half Dome tomorrow? First time in what, two years? Two years, yeah. Two years. Two years. Feel good. I mean, yeah, we'll see what you say tomorrow I, this time. I'm not saying it's not going to be a challenge. This yes, tomorrow we're doing Half Dome. Yeah, this time tomorrow we better be down from Half Dome. In recent years, daring freestyle climbers like Alex Honnold and Tommy Caldwell have piqued interest in climbing the massive granite walls of Yosemite National Park. But Sarah and I are not that crazy. We have, however, been daring enough to attempt climbing Half Dome the safer way, up the backside and along a route equipped with cables. But it's not for the faint of heart. The Yosemite Mountain Shop in the former Curry Village pays tribute to legends of rock climbing, including the three men who made history by scaling the northwest face of Half Dome in 1957. They were Jerry Galmas, Royal Robbins, and Mike Sherrick. Robin's climbing world rival was Warren J. Harding, who in 1959 became the first man to climb the face of El Capitan. In 2005, I met Royal Robbins in his clothing store in Modesto. As I asked him to draw Half Dome and sign his sketch, I told him that I had gone up the famous rock the easy way, up the cables, to which he replied, there is no easy way to the top of Half Dome. In 1964, Tom Frost, Royal Robbins, Chuck Pratt, and Avon Chouinard stood atop a summit following a 10-day ascent of El Capitan's North American Wall. Their feat seems less than stellar when you consider that in June 2017, Alex Honnold climbed El Capitan without ropes in just under four hours. The shop also mentions how in 1875, George Anderson was the first man to ever climb Half Dome. What's that for? That's to carry all the stuff that I need instant access to while we're hiking. So I don't have to keep getting into my backpack. I can get my tissues and lip balm. Not very big. It doesn't need to be very big. And then? And this is the, I made it to the top of Half Dome t-shirt. While I haven't made it up this time, I've made it up before. Oh, so. look at that. Elevation gain of 4,800 feet. We got up at 3.30 and it's pretty uh, cold. Trailhead parking is not even close to being filled, so we're here pretty early. This is Sarah's idea of getting up the crack of dawn. If I didn't, we would be here an hour later, an hour further behind. That's not a good idea. Yeah, as it is, we look like crap, but. Look like crap. She's gonna work. Fashion show, she's, don't you know? She's gonna worry about um, how she feels at the end of the day. Uh, I'm not worried about that yet. I'm not gonna worry about it till I feel it. Glacier Point up there. Over 3,000 feet above the trailhead parking lot is the Glacier Point Rock upon which President Theodore Roosevelt stood in a famous pose in 1903 with John Muir. Standing on an overhanging rock, they enjoy a commanding view of Half Dome, Yosemite Falls, Liberty Camp, and Nevada and Vernal Falls. Register Rock is just above the Vernal Falls Bridge where a toll house was constructed in 1875 to extract a 75 cent toll for the passing on Miss Trail or the horse trail above it that leads to Nevada Fall. Where are you? 
dirty haunt. Very. Get ready to go up and get wet. When white men settled Yosemite in 1856, there was already a primitive Indian trail to Vernal and Nevada Falls, probably along the present horse trail. Right behind me is Vernal Falls, and it's going to start raining down on us. It's not too wet today. Almost to the top of Vernal, but not quite. The steps are very steep. We have reached the staircase to Vernal Falls, but I can tell you if there was an earthquake right now, not a good place to be. Early day visitors to Vernal Falls had to use a dangerously slippery wooden ladder that was propped up under this arch of rock. The ladders were constructed in 1858 as part of a toll road created south of the river by Stephen Cunningham and others. Albert Snow built two new ladders up the Vernal Fall cliff face in 1871 to charge a toll of 75 cents for people brave enough to climb it. San Francisco restaurant owner Giacomo Campi was climbing the ladder in June 1871 when he slipped to his death. The state took over the ladder in 1882 the ladders were closed in 1890 and by 1897 replaced by the stone steps used today. Well, that is Vernal Falls. We've made it this far. It's about 7.15 in the morning, so we're making pretty good time. Trapped him up there. That little ball thing. Just above Vernal Falls. Building a trail to the top of Nevada Falls and Aftil required a building of a bridge to cross this fork of the Mississippi River. And in 1866, the state commissioned the building of that bridge. At this location, this is not the original bridge, but this is a replacement of that bridge. So way back in the early Yosemite settlers, they built, they built hotels all around this place. And this location right here, they built a hotel called Snow's Hotel. And travelers actually stopped in here. It's no longer here today, but it's somewhere in this area. Albert and Emily Snow came to California from Vermont and for nearly 20 years operated their Alpine House Hotel near Nevada Fall. In 1864, Congress placed Yosemite Valley under the care of the state of California, which governed the park under a board of commissioners. The board approved hotels all over Yosemite, including the Stoneman House seen here. In 1869, Albert Snow sought permission to build a hotel at the base of Nevada Fall and a toll trail from the end of the existing Vernal Fall Trail to Nevada Fall. The Alpine House hosted its first visitors on April 28, 1870. The Snows offered weary travelers lodging and food such as baked bread, pies, beans, donuts, and baked apples. In 1871, the snows doubled the size of the Alpine House, but a year later it was damaged by an earthquake that shook boulders loose. After a second expansion in 1875, the inn became known as La Casa Nevada, Spanish for the Snow House. The hotel included the 12-room original building, 10-bedroom chalet, woodshed, ice house, log cabin, and stable. Accounts suggest that Emily Snow often dispensed humorous quips. She was known to tell visitors, you folks would hardly think of it, but there were 11 feet of snow here all summer. When asked how it was possible, she replied, Well, my husband is near six feet tall, and I'm a little over five. Ain't that 11? On another occasion, when a young man asked for milk, she replied that it was time for him to be weaned. Because of their advancing age, the snows gave up their inn in the fall of 1889. Emily died within weeks, and Albert two years later. The inn was taken over but abandoned in the 1890s. The decaying hotel was destroyed by fire in 1900. 
Galen Clark, who spent 24 years as the first guardian of Yosemite, was a frequent visitor to the Alpine House. He helped write federal legislation preserving Yosemite and is buried in his beloved Yosemite Valley. Among its guests were James Hutchings, an early promoter of Yosemite through his illustrated magazine. Seen here at the top of Nevada Falls, Hutchings was fond of the snows and a frequent visitor on his many treks up to Half Dome. Hutchings explored Yosemite in 1855 and made the first documented attempt to climb Half Dome in 1859. It would be 16 years later until Anderson conquered the granite monolith. This photo of Hutchings and wife in Yosemite 1902 was taken moments before his horse reared up and fatally threw him from his buggy. Another visitor to the inn was John Muir, the legendary explorer who fought for the preservation of Yosemite. He's seen here with his back to the camera gazing at Nevada Fall, and here atop Nevada Fall. So what you're hearing is the roar of Nevada Falls right in front of me. This trail is really difficult. Uh, especially if you're not used to the elevation. It's a real butt kicker, for sure. Sarah's up ahead of me. She's doing quite well. How is that for a view? That's <laughs> Nevada Falls. Beautiful. Sarah's coming up behind me. She's got some poles that assist her in the climb. So I've, I've read one historical account that states that, that this rock trail from the hotel to the top of Nevada Fall was built in 1871 by a man named John Conway. It was really an amazing accomplishment when you consider how many holes were, were drilled and how much rock had to be split. And then it had to be placed for steps. There's no way this could have been done all by himself. And it's very possible that he got help from the innkeeper down below, Albert Snow. This section called the Royal Staircase near Nevada Fall was in place before this photo was taken, sometime in the 1890s. We have reached the flat part of the trail, which is the best part of the trail because you don't have to exert yourself going uphill or downhill, but it's short-lived. We'll be going up another steep incline all the way to the top of Half Dome, which is another kick butt thing. Fork of the Merced River over here. If you want to get water, this is the place to get it. Staying hydrated? Yep. Taking off my compression socks. And putting my shorts on. Or my shorts are on, I just gotta take my pants off. It's not too damn hot up there. This lady wants to get up there real bad. This will be your second time, right? The top or third? It'll be my second time up the cables, third time up sub dome. <sighs> it's gonna be grueling. Yeah. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah. Slow and steady. The National Park Service was good enough to create some toilets back here on the and they use a solar type of disposal system, so they don't have to come in and pump the septic tanks and stuff. Took a little rest here in the shade because I'm 56 years old and I don't come up here like when I was 17 years old the first time, which incidentally was thinner. 39 years ago, this month, I made my first trek up here as a teenager. It was in 1979. Huh. <laughs> she was four. She was four years old. That makes me a cradle robber. <laughs> the first butt kicker is Vernal Falls. Second butt kicker is Nevada, Nevada Falls. And we're now on the third butt kicker. The switchback. Which goes into the switchback, which is the worst butt kicker of all. No. And cables aren't that bad. Which goes into that <laughs> ascent up to the subdome. That's the worst butt kicker. You think that's worse? Yeah, because that's, I can only get a few steps and then I have to slow and stop. And if I'm going this slow now, boy, we're in trouble. See yeah. <laughs> I know, we need to pick up the pace. No. A little bit. I can't. Look behind me. It's the half dome. You don't say. From the back. About two weeks ago, a guy fell to his death off this cable. Breaking news out of Yosemite National Park tonight, the body of a hiker was recovered just a few hours ago after he fell off Half Dome. The hiker fell from the cables around 4.30 yesterday, we're told. We don't intend to be casualties of that thing. As long as you hold on to the cables, you're absolutely fine. Eight people have died on the cables since they were put up in 1919. So about the time that white men first entered Yosemite in the 1850s, 1840s, uh, everybody said that Half Dome could not be scaled because it's too formidable, too steep, no way to get up. That was until 1875. A man by the name of George Anderson, some history books refer to him as a Viking, big guy, apparently very brave, he decided to go up by drilling holes in the rock and attaching little eye hooks and slowly reaching up drilling another hole pulling himself up putting his foot on the lower hooks and then eventually attaching a rope well on October 12 1875 he made it to the top and apparently he told everybody about it because there was a group of Englishmen there was six Englishmen that wanted to go up four days later he brought them up only four made it the other two chickened out and it said that in November John Muir came up here, so he was the ninth person to make it to the top of Half Dome. Galen Clark was 65 when he followed Anderson's feet. By 1882, Anderson was planning to build a wooden staircase to the top of Half Dome with the hope of making a small fortune from tolls. While collecting timber for the project, he became sick and died alone in his cabin. He was 48 or 49 when he died in May 1884 and is buried in Yosemite Valley's Pioneer Cemetery. In the past 143 years, people have been coming up to the top of Half Dome. 1919, they put up the cables. And thousands have been up here. And I'm so out of breath. Yeah. Shot of this, how she uh, takes in air and water at the same time. <laughs> Are you refreshed now? Ready to go on? No? Trying. Park girl. Two miles, oh my gosh. Now, unbeknownst to many people, Chipotle burritos are a good way to eat on this trip. As we found out, people said that it was a good good idea, huh? Uh -huh. See, and we we bought it the day before, put it in the fridge. Her burrito's like a brick. I don't realize how heavy a Chipotle burrito is until you <laughs> have to lug it up. Have to lug it up half dome. <laughs> and it's right over there, through the trees. Or is that sub dome? I can't tell anymore. What's sub? 
we're like, we're like delirious from all the uh, exertion to get up this trail. I think the biggest problem is when it, it's like overheating. Oh, the backpacks? Yeah. Yeah. Because we were still about an hour from the top and way behind schedule, and Sarah was experiencing significant pain, we decided against our half dome ascent this time. The awesome view of the valley would have to suffice as we remembered the good memories of our last ascent to the top in 2016. On their hike back to Happy Isles, across the flat section behind Half Dome, Jeff nearly stepped on this rattlesnake crossing their path. Since the bedrock of the world was laid, the granite monolith of Half Dome has been the guardian of the world's most beautiful spot. Millions have gazed on its face and wondered what it's like to stand on top. But it's an experience not attained without physical pain and exertion, unless you happen to be the moon and easily roll up its backside. The world is always changing, but it seems Half Dome is a constant, and that's a good thing because something this grand and awe-inspiring should stay around as long as mankind to enjoy it.